Hello and welcome to another video from the vault where we peek into a classroom and see what there is to learn. Today we'll learn a little more about logical statements. Enjoy! So when we have a problem that needs some logical argument, but still just in, in words, but we need to be very clear and careful about how we say things, saying things correctly, uh, creating sentences that are statements. Remember what a statement is? No vague sentences. It's a sentence that's either true or false. Nothing in the middle. But there's also, uh, we, we can say things in a casual way when we just chat with someone, but when we present an argument or try and piece things together to create an argument that someone else can read and follow very easily, then we have to be especially careful for how we say things. Saying things uh, in, a very, in a much more precise day, way than you might do so casually. Uh, for example, let's suppose we have the following problem. Three people go to a hotel and to stay overnight and they eat a very cheap hotel. Uh, the hotel room for all three of them uh, is just $30. So they each contribute $10 uh, for the room which they then give to the front desk. The, then they go up and the bellboy takes up their bags and at the room they give the bellboy sorry, they give, let me just get the wording right here, the bellboy comes in later. Uh, because they paid in cash the hotel uh, manager decides to give them a discount, give them five dollars back and he sends the bellboy with the bags up uh, to return the five dollars back to them. But on the way, the bellboy thinks, oh, I have five dollars, I'm just going to pretend that they got three back, I'll give them each one dollar, and I'll keep the remaining two dollars for myself. So that means each of the people paid nine dollars, because he gave them one back from their ten. Nine dollars times three, that's twenty-seven plus the two dollars that the bellboy has that gives 29, where is the missing dollar? The point here, you can think about it, I'm not giving you the answer. There's a missing dollar. The point is that how you, how you say things, how you piece the sentences together, uh, even though each sentence makes perfect sense, how you string them together can be confusing as well. And we have to be careful when we're trying to come up with our own argument that not only does each sentence uh, make sense logically, but also uh, how they all read as one uh, unit. You can think about that a uh, little puzzle, and if you have any thoughts, let me know. So in order to think about how we say things uh, more carefully, we have a statement, for example, let's take the one in the book. The first one in exercise 2.2, we can have a book and say, let's just say this is the statement. Pretend I have a book in my hand. Oh, I do have a book in my hand. <laughs> this book. I'm making a statement, has 500 pages. It doesn't have to be true, but it has to be either true or false. Now clearly, this book does not have 500 pages, so the statement is false. That's not the point. The point is, it is a sentence that qualifies as a statement because Anyone can look at the book and determine it's true or false. It has to be one of the two. No vague sentences. 
<clears throat> we also want to, from this, come up with uh, another statement that, it's, that is partnered with this one. And we call it the negation, let's say here. It is the statement that that has, uh, I'll just shorten it here, the opposite truth value, let's say to the given statement. I'm giving you a statement like this one, the book has 500 pages. There is another statement that it stands on the, at the opposite end of this one. The opposite truth value means that whenever this one is true, the negation has to be false. And we'll have to figure out what that negation is. Whenever this statement is false, the negation has to be true. So they're always, if it's not one, it's the other. And if it's the other one, then it's not the given one. Does that make sense? So in this case, if my given statement is, this book has 500 pages, what would be, or what could be, the negation statement? If this is not true, then the negation has to be true. So I have to come up with a sentence that would be true whenever this one is false. So if this is not true, what is true? This book does not have five hundred. The book does not have five hundred pages. So through this, we're really just trying to think about what's what sentences are saying, when they are true, when they are not. So the negation for our purposes really just gives us a time to think about when things are true, when they're not true, and if they're not true, what is true, and how we're saying things. We're not really doing much more with that, it's just an exercise to start thinking about saying things carefully. And when you read a sentence, really looking at what it's saying, no more, no less. Are there any questions about given a, sent uh, a statement, a sentence? How we, what do we mean by the negation of that statement? Any questions on that? Ask yourself this, if the given statement is not true, then what should I write down that is true whenever this is not true? Well, if the book doesn't have 500 pages, the book doesn't have 500 pages. But depending on the given statement, it can get a little more tricky. Let's just turn the camera, which I will do all the time throughout the semester. Uh, number, I should probably number these right. This was number one in exercise 2.2, which I could probably show on the screen, which I said I was going to do. I'm going to say things and don't do it. There we go. So this is then, let's just number it, number two statement. I know it's there, I'm just going to write it down because writing down something makes me think about it a little bit more than just reading it. So I won't do it for very long. Statement, all students like Hamburgers. So I'll just say the, the goal here is to not read ahead before class and then, oh, I have all the answers because I read ahead. Uh, it's not really the point. The, the point of the book is to review what we said and think about it in your own time. Uh, this should be new concepts so that we can discuss it. So, If I'm given a statement, all students like burgers, what could be the negation? Not all students like hamburgers? Well, that sounds a little clumsy. 
So I want, you're not wrong, but I want to <clears throat> let me clean it up and make it sound like we would say it, uh, like you would normally say it. Sorry? Okay, let me just backtrack. You guys are better than I thought. <laughs> so I have to make it. I was open to this one. <clears throat> but I guess I don't always get what I want. Usually, this is the suggested answer. And maybe some of you had that answer. That was the one I was hoping for. I don't always hope for the right answer. <clears throat> it feels, especially when we just talk casually, uh, if we think about all students like burgers, or well, what's the opposite? Especially kids would totally say this. No students like burgers. The problem is that if this is not true, if it's not true that all students like burgers, the negation has to be true. That's what we mean by the opposite. It has to be everything else. Is it necessarily the case that no students like hamburgers? No, what if it's a mix? I went with the negation, I went to the other extreme, but there are people in the middle. Some could like it, some could not. This is a uh, sort of an extreme statement, or an absolute statement. All students like it. You can't jump to the other extreme and say no students like it. What about the middle? That's not covered by either one. So if this is false, and I have, let's say, 50-50, half people like burgers and half do not, then it has to be covered by the negation, but it's not. So I can adjust this phrasing to make sure that the negation is true whenever the given statement is not. Anytime the given statement is not true, I have to phrase it in such a way that that situation is covered by the negation. So what you could do is have a little diagram regarding people that like uh, burgers. ranging from none to all. Clearly there are things in the middle where some people like it and some people don't. What is covered by the statement? Only this one. Only here. So the negation has to cover everything else. The negation has to be true anywhere else. And if you say no students like burgers, then you're only sitting there and you're missing everything else that it should cover. So how can we fix it? Let's just grab that, but it's not... It is possible, but it's not accurate enough because I'm missing some things that could be true if the given statement is false. So what could I say? What did you say? Some, right? Some students, uh, what did you say again? Some students like hamburgers. Like hamburgers? Is that an improvement on the incorrect first attempt? No. That's subjective. There's no wrong answer there. Uh, it does sound like an improvement, yes, because. I don't want to go to the other extreme and say no, but is that correct? Do I have this left extreme covered with that negation attempt? I'm now missing this one. Because if I say some students like hamburgers, then that's never going to happen. So I'm missing this. So I'm getting stuff in the middle, but I'm missing this one. Yeah. Some students don't like yeah, that would be a little better. Maybe that's what you meant. Some students don't like hamburgers. I have to simply, with the negation, phrase it in such a way that I have the possibility that there is one or more they don't like it, so that I can step just away from this all extreme. As soon as one person 
uh, doesn't like burgers, then I'm away from this and part of the negation. If I have a sentence like this, some students don't like hamburgers. Does it cover the possibility that absolutely no one likes burgers? It should, but I have to look at my attempt and make sure that it does. It has to cover all of this. So if, I, if the actual situation that's happening is over here, is the negation true? That some people don't like burgers? Yeah. Because there's some that don't. There's only a certain number that do. The rest of them don't. Some people don't, some people don't, some people don't, some people don't. If I'm over here, or absolute, that's not what I, I can observe outside, that's what actually happens. So the statement is not true. In fact, no one likes uh, burgers. Is my negation statement attempt true? It has to be. Or maybe I need to adjust the phrase. If actually no one likes burgers, is it true that some students don't like burgers? Is that true? A shake and a nod. <laughs> See, it's tricky. We have to. We're doing this so that we can really critically look at how we say things and when things are true or not. Well, let's ask a different question. Um, how should we make another example? Let's suppose uh, someone surveys this class, and let's focus on the burgers. Let's focus on the burgers. Uh, let's suppose they come in and they start asking each one in turn, do you like burgers? And she says no. Do you like burgers? She says no. If they go out and they tell a friend, some people in this class said they don't like burgers. Is that true? This is true. She just said it. But now let's suppose this surveyor comes in and asks, and the answer is no. Do you like burgers? No. No, no, no. Every single one says no. They go out and they tell their friend, some people said they don't like burgers. Of course that's true. There were some people. Just happened to be all of them that said they don't like burgers. So we have to start thinking about these things to get more comfortable that, that some word can be deceptive. So let's change it, perhaps. That is correct. But let's change this to refer to something more precise, maybe. Maybe a number or something. Uh, you could also say, uh, at least one student doesn't like hamburgers. And that would be equivalent. So this sum and at least one can be swapped as you feel comfortable. <coughs> you can always use some. You can use an at least one. At least one just feels a little bit more precise. What does at least one mean? One or <coughs> more. So you can say that as well. One or more student doesn't like hamburgers. Could be all of them. And I'm on the left extreme. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. As long as the negation covers everything that's not there. Well, with a couple more examples, it'll hopefully make a little more sense. What we're trying to do here is just be careful in how we say things. And critical in how we interpret things. Because you can't have good arguments if... That doesn't happen. Let's go to three. Uh, where's three? Some people like math. So I have a given statement, and I want to write the negation. Everyone has <laughs> negation. 
Everyone has the statement in front of them in your book or on the screen for now, in case you don't have a book yet. Everyone, no, some people, some people, some people like math. So let the diagram help you. It's nice, we're visual, most of us are visual people. Seeing a diagram just makes things so much easier. So now we're going to refer to people liking math. And the given statement is true whenever some people like math. So remember, some is the same as at least one. So if you like at least one or one or more, use that instead. Wherever you see a sum, swap it out. So you can also read this as at least one person likes math. So when you go from none liking math to all, what is covered by the given statement? Is this covered? No. Is this covered? Yes. Is that covered? No. Oh. Yeah. Some is the same as at least one, which is the same as one or more. One or more has no end, so it could be everyone. As long as it's more than uh, one or more. It could be everyone. So what's covered is just not that, but everything and also all. As long as it's one or more. There's no end. Nothing excludes the all. Ask yourself this. Someone comes in, surveys. Do you like math? Do you like math? Do you like math? So let's say everyone answers yes. They go out there. They tell their friend. Uh, some people said they like math. Yes, that's true. It happens to be all of them. So the only thing that the negation has to then cover is the, the case where no one likes math. So if the given statement is not true, then what is true? No one likes math. Oh, that's sad. It's starting to make a little more sense. Just a little. Little steps forward, and in the end, you look back and you travel the long, long way. One more. What is the next one? The given statement is everyone in class has a calculator. So let's look at having. A calculator from none to all. What's covered by when is the given statement true? Everyone in class has a calculator, so that's only here. So the negation has to be phrased in such a way that whenever this is not true, whatever is true is covered by the negation. So the negation could be, does anyone want to try? Doesn't matter if you're wrong, yes. Could it be the same as the other one? At least one person has a calculator? She says, at least one person has a calculator. So we're trying to cover this, right? Is that a tenth? Perfectly correct. I think you just missed the word. Does not. Does not. Calculator. Because if I say that, then the negation is true in that case as well. I'm pretty sure you meant does not. I'm pretty sure this So in that way then. I'm stepping away with one or more person not having a calculator to the left. I just need to step away from this all situation. And then the negation will cover everything. It could be that no one has a calculator. One or more people don't have calculators. All, well, that's a bad one. Uh, it could be absolutely everyone says, no, I don't have a calculator, and then I'm at this extreme. But there are some stuff in the middle. And because the statement doesn't cover that, the negation should. So again, all we're trying to do is just think about how we say things and how we read things. What does it mean, what I'm reading? 
I want to be precise, or I cannot come up with my own arguments, or follow other arguments that have multiple sentences. I have to think about each one, and the wording used can be very tricky, even though casually we say things, and then in the context you can help the person understand. On paper, when you write something or read something, the other person is not there to help you. So it has to stand alone on what it is. A variation that I like is in 2.3, it is essentially the same, but for some reason it feels more intuitive to me. It could be just me. Where I ask uh, the following question, how would you disprove the following statements? So someone comes in, they say, all dogs are fluffy. What would you have to do to prove them wrong? Possible, practical or not, what would you have to do to prove them wrong? It's just another spin on the negation concept, but it feels a little more intuitive to me. They come in, they say, all dogs are fluffy. No, you're wrong. What would I have to do? I have to show or find a dog that's not fluffy. So just a little more intuitive spin on the negation concept. Does that make sense? What would you have to do? Not that it's necessarily uh, practically possible. They come in, they say, some people do not like to eat turnips. So think about the diagram again. From liking, right? Liking turnips. None to all. They claim what has happened. Some people, oh sorry, do not. Not. You decide beforehand what does your line represent, and then work within that. Oops. Not liking turnips, they say some people don't. Some is the same as at least one, which is the same as one or more. So they're saying all of this is something here is happening. That's what they claim. What would I have to show to prove them wrong? I would have to show that we're right there. And that's what actually, what's actually happening. So you can have your initial phrasing and then clean it up if you want to. No people uh, do not like to eat turnips. Yes, I know that's a very clumsy sentence, double negative and all that. That's not how we would actually speak. But once we have it, we can now uh, clean it up to something a little uh, nicer. Let's say your cleaner version. How can you clean that up? You can totally leave it like that. We're doing, we don't have to be grammatically perfect. That's not what we're trying to do here. So you can leave it like that if you don't want to risk your cleaned version being slightly different. But how could you clean that up? We say, no people don't like. <laughs> That's weird. It doesn't sound right at all. I just have to make sure I'm here. So I can phrase it uh, instead of with a not liking turnips as liking turnips. If no one dislikes turnips, what does that mean in terms of liking turnips? Everybody, Everybody li likes turnips. So the two negatives cancel, and you can say in many ways. Let's say all. Keep, uh, let's not use the word all because it's right there. So everyone likes turnips. The double negative cancels. But you don't have to clean it up if you don't want to. Likes to eat turnips. You don't have to clean it up if you don't want to. I don't care about grammar uh, right now. I just want, want to get the idea of what we're trying to do and start looking at start looking at wording and sentences and their meaning, not their grammar, but what they're trying to say. Uh, three. 
Everyone plays better tennis than Fred or Fred. I'm, I don't know if that's true or not, but someone comes in, we all know Fred, and they say, everyone plays better tennis than Fred. Well, think about what does that mean with, with a diagram. Uh, so now we can say this refers to people playing better than Fred from none to all. They're claiming that everyone plays better. So they're saying what's happening is right there and nothing else. So what would I have to do to prove them wrong? Does anyone want to try? What would I have to go out there and do? Find someone that's better. Uh, yeah, sure, we can say it like that. Find, uh, let's just say, a person that, I'll say it like this, though. So, so we refer to playing better, that does not play better, oh, that's not good, sorry, than Fred. You can phrase it in many ways. You can say, find at least one person. Find some people. As long as you find one, could be more, there could be many people that play better, uh, that doesn't play better. You just need one to push the claim away from that extreme. One more in number four. What does it say? Nobody plays mini golf. Strong statement. Whether it's true or not, what would you have to do to disprove it? Well, start the camera. Look at the diagram. Visualize what's happening. It makes a huge difference. Huge difference. Uh, what is it referred to? Nobody plays mini golf. So this is now <clears throat> playing mini golf. From none to all. Someone comes in, they make this claim, where are they positioned? They're positioned right there. No one plays me at all. What would you have to do to prove them wrong? Find someone. Find someone. This version is easier to come up with an answer. It just feels a little more natural. Find someone that uh, plays me. Oops. So that I'm just away. Could be everyone plays mini golf. I just need to find one person, at least one, some, one or more. This is starting to feel a little better. Diagram makes a huge difference. Huge difference. People are so reluctant when you tell them, oh, just look at some examples or make a little sketch. No, no, I don't want to do that. That shows weakness or something. I don't know. But it makes such a difference. You're giving yourself time to process what the question is giving you, and visualizing things make a, make a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. Now we come to the third type of question that's a little different, but I still have to really look at uh, really look at what statements are giving me. Exercise 2.3. Now you can read the little part there in the textbook, but We'll do it by example. So, not three, not three, no. four. So what we now have, if you look at that, there, in number one, for example, there are a bunch of uh, statements. And I'm trying to determine if it's a logically sound argument. 
meaning that I have three statements. One, two, three. This is the conclusion that is being made. This is statement one, this is statement two. But I'm trying to figure out, when am I going to say that the argument is sound? I'm going to only be able to say that if this is true, let's see here, if this is true, whatever the first statement is, and if this is true, then is this true? Is the conclusion true? So I'll assume that the first two statements are true. And working with that, can I conclude beyond any doubt that the conclusion is correct. When we do an example, we'll, we'll quickly see. So, you're sort of playing a game in that you're assuming whatever the first, sentence, the first two sentences say, you're assuming that's true. Can I draw the correct, can I draw the conclusion every time from those first two sentences? Is it a sound argument? So let's see, let's see. First, Statement in number one, in number one, right? First statement says, all college students are brilliant. Actually true or not, we assume it's true. All college students are brilliant. So what I could do is try and visualize what's happening here. It makes a huge difference. So if I make a circle that represents college students, it says all college students are brilliant as well. There could be brilliant people that are not college students. So when I want to put the circle of all brilliant people somewhere on the board, it's going to have to be outside containing the college students. Because if you're a college student, you have to be brilliant as well. But there could be somewhere else. There they are. Ooh, they don't have arms. Right. Uh, they could be brilliant too. doesn't have to be a college student. Does that make sense? So if we assume that the first statement is true, this is the situation. Then there's another statement. All brilliant people are scientists. So if you're a brilliant person, it doesn't talk, the second sentence doesn't talk any, say anything about <coughs> college students. It says if you're a brilliant person, then you are a scientist. So I have to put the scientist circle outside so that whenever you're a brilliant person, wherever you may be in the brilliant circle, you're automatically a scientist. There could be scientists that aren't brilliant. I just have to make sure that the sentence is true. Now the question is, can I... So I didn't have any choice setting up these circles. The first two statements being true forced me to do that. Can I conclude the third uh, sentence? Therefore, all college students are scientists. Is there any doubt? that that conclusion is true. Looking at the diagram. No, all college students are in the scientist circle. has to be true. So it's a valid argument. There's no way that that is not true. All right, let's do one more. And then we'll hopefully see uh, number two. I'm taking the first two is true and seeing if the third one follows necessarily. All poets are happy. So if I put the poet circle over here, where should the happy circle be? Inside or outside? Outside. Outside. So that whenever you're a poet, you are happy because that's what the statement says. Happy people. Everyone happy with that? Mm -hmm. Then the second one should also be true. Some poets are lazy. Now we haven't had a some 
sentence before. It doesn't mean all poets are lazy. It just means there is a poet that is also lazy. So, it's not one circle contained in another, but rather it's an overlap. It's an overlap. Now it could be over here. As long as I have a poet, he's happy, right? Smiling. He's in the happy circle. Or she. They have to, there has to be someone that's lazy as well. Just some. Not all. Could be all. But I don't necessarily, I can't conclude, I can't necessarily assume that. As long as there are some poets that are lazy. So a sum <coughs> word means an overlap. An all word means one circles inside the other. Now that's my setup from the first two uh, sentences. And the conclusion is, therefore, some lazy people are happy. Is there any way I can say that that's not true? No, because there will always be a poet that's lazy. And that poet, because they're a poet, they're going to be happy. So again, it's a valid argument, because there's no way that based on my diagram, it can't be true. I can't get the lazy, I can't get the lazy circle out of the happy circle because it needs to overlap with the poet circle. How is this feeling? Think of it as a puzzle. I'm trying to, I would love that third sentence to not be true. But if I just can't get the circles to work, I have to conclude it's valid. I want this lazy circle to be outside and say it's, a, it's not a valid argument. But because it has to overlap with poets, poets are inside happy, I don't have a choice. Any questions on that? All right, let's do number three. See enough variation. What does it say now? Some poets are unsuccessful. Some. Not necessarily all. I can't assume all. So if I have my poet circle, where should the unsuccessful people circle be? Just an overlap. As long as there are some poets that are unsuccessful. That's all I need. So I have to have an overlap. That first sentence being true forces me to have at least an overlap. Then the second one has to be true as well. Some athletes are unsuccessful. Some athletes are unsuccessful. Now I'm trying to disprove, I'm trying to come up with a configuration, a layout that shows the argument's not valid. And that third sentence doesn't necessarily follow. And if I can do that, that's my goal. If it turns out I absolutely can't, I have to conclude it's valid. I'm trying to come up with something that shows it's not a valid argument. So I can put the athlete circle over here, because all that second sentence is saying is that athletes have to intersect with unsuccessful. Some athletes are unsuccessful. That second sentence says nothing about poetry. Some of them could be both, but I don't necessarily know. Does the third one, third sentence follow necessarily? It says, therefore, some poets are athletes. No, because I came up with a layout. The first statement is true, the second statement is true, but the third one doesn't necessarily follow, and I can conclude that's not a valid argument. Because in reality, this could be what happened. The first two sentences would be true, but not the third one. It's not a guarantee that some uh, what is it? some poets are athletes. Not a guarantee. Yes. Do we have to use valid and not valid, or could we just say true and false? It's not a matter of true necessarily, because I don't know what's actually happening. Okay. The question is only if the first two sentences are true. Can I, with 100% certainty, conclude the third one? 
if I go out there and actually investigate poets and athletes, the truth value might be different. It's irrelevant in a way. Is the argument valid? So I don't really know if it's true or not. Because I'm not actually investigating people. I'm saying, I'm asking, is the argument, does the third sentence follow from the first two? True or not? So there is a subtle difference between those two. Last one. All geniuses are illogical. Now that's an all statement. So if I draw the genius circle, circle of genius people, where should the circle of illogical people be? Outside. Outside, so that any genius will automatically be illogical. Again, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm assuming it's true to see if the third statement follows. The actual truth value of these sentences are irrelevant. Then the second one, some politicians are illogical. That only requires that politicians and illogical people overlap. So I'm trying to show that that third sentence doesn't necessarily follow 100% of the time. So I have to sort of scan ahead and see, well, what am I trying to disprove here? Therefore, some politicians are geniuses. So I have to, well, I can then say, well, no, I can make politicians sit over there. And then the second sentence would still be true. Some politicians are illogical. But they don't have to overlap with genius. And therefore, the third sentence wouldn't necessarily follow from the first two. It's not a valid argument. So those are tricky things, unless we take the time to think about them. So I'm taking the time now. Think about how we say things. What it means when we read something. Really think about it critically so that we can say things correctly when we need to come up with an argument. Please remember to click the like button if you enjoyed the video and to subscribe if you want to be notified of more videos. Also, uh, please visit me on my Patreon page if you want to support me in making further content. Thank you.